going to take a lighthearted look at seven habits of highly defective leaders that we probably all have demonstrated at some point in our career or will yet to do later. What I'd like to do is have some, some ability to recognize these bad habits in yourself and others and then end that all with you know, what that is, how to deal with it, how to survive it, and tips for advancing beyond that if your defective leader is your current leader or if, uh, if it's you, ways to get around that. Very rarely is the first bad habit of refusing to make a decision an overt refusal to make a decision, but how many times has the outcome of a meeting been we need to have another meeting. <laughs> if you have all the information, all the right people, make the decision. It may not be the perfect decision, but rarely is it better to delay unless the situation will change something. But that's rarely the case. It's sometimes just for, from the defector's leader's perspective, it's just a way to defer the point of making a decision. And that comes from a reluctance to, to assume risk. Uh, that's inherent in the nature of decision making is that you have to accept the risk that you might be wrong. And someone who has this bad habit does not want to take a risk that they have made the wrong choice. No one likes to be wrong. We get that. But no one should expect to always be right either. It's frequently far better to work in a workplace with a leader who is decisive, even if they're occasionally wrong. No one can expect to always be right. It's, a, it's an unfair assumption for yourself and for your workplace if you have your risk tolerance tuned way too high. It's frequently associated with thorny personnel issues. We get it. That's why they're difficult decisions. The easy ones have already been made. And if they are even within your authority and you're delaying it just for defective reasons, oftentimes the thorniest ones you'll get will be people and other people. But make those decisions and move on. It is the ripping the Band-Aid off kind of an idea. Your workplace will be better off for it. You won't always be right, but it will pay dividends in the long run to make that decision and move on. It goes with the mantle of leadership. A good question to ask somebody that is in the habit of deferring decisions is, are we adding any value? Will the passage of more time change anything that would change how the decision would go. In technical terms, that's sensitivity analysis. Some things can change the outcome of a decision, and if those situations need to develop more, that's fine. But if nothing's going to change, a good question to ask a defective leader is, will delaying this decision add any value to it or change it in any way, or is it just you need to be more comfortable with it? Which can be fine. But it's a great question to ask yourself or your leader. So this kind of perspective comes from living in the short term, not thinking long term. It is a very short term. The defective leader is thinking, get me out of this difficult conversation that I don't want to have with these people asking me to make a decision that I don't want to make. And they're the boss, so they can punt the decision to the next meeting or decide it later. So it ignores the cost of delay, though, and it ignores the frustration and that the uncertainty around the issue uh, even if you already know how the leader will decide, it can be frustrating on everybody associated with it for a defective leader to delay and defer decisions without adding any value or letting the situation develop in any way. So some helpful tips for managing a defective leader or yourself if you find that they don't like to make routine decisions. If you see a bit of yourself in any of these, please take note. Defective leaders are always asking for more information, more data when pressed for a decision. And if furnishing that data will help make a better decision, go and get it and serve it back up because now you know that this piece of information is needed to make this decision. But don't let perfect become the enemy of good. We've all heard that phrase before. The distance between nothing and something is infinitely larger than, dis than the distance between something and perfection. It's, it's, it's far better to be close to good than to go from good to perfection. And rarely are we aiming for perfection, especially if you have a defective leader or you are yourself the defective leader. And a, a way to, to, uh, to work on this never-ending search for data is just straight up ask the defective leader, will this change the decision? Or you know, how, in what way will this change the decision? And if they are actually thinking about, well, if this, then that, if this, then that, then you know that furnishing that data will provide the information you need to take that next step. One manifestation of indecision is not even answering an email. I've got 50 
5,000 unread email messages in my Gmail. Most of it's marketing garbage, uh, as is most of our email accounts these days. But a very common technique it, for a defective leader is when reading an email that they don't want to deal with is just ignore it. If it's an important situation and it needs to be addressed, they'll come back up. It's kind of the thought process behind it. So if you are asking a question or asking for approval in an email of a defective leader, don't. Use the technique of tacit approval instead. If you find yourself engaging with someone who routinely uh, routinely doesn't answer your email. Uh, one of my subordinates does this to me, so I'd like to think that she was trained on that behavior by a different leader, uh, but we'll see, uh, we'll see. It's been 10 years, uh, she's fine. Because uh, uh, she, will, she will highlight needs approval in the, the subject line of the, the, it's not just an FYI, she'll say needs approval. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I have to make a decision here. An even better way to deal with someone who doesn't even want to make the decision in the first place, much less answer the email, will be to use the concept of tacit approval, where you say, unless I hear from you by this time, I will assume that this is an, you know, an acceptable course of action, and we'll proceed down this, course, down this path. And if it's fine, it's fine. You probably won't hear anything back. Another way to deal with an indecisive leader is to get comfortable with ambiguity. Some people very much like to have the perfect confidence that they, they know that their boss has told them and approved everything that they are doing. And that's, it's a warm, happy space to know you're within the, the boundary. And an indecisive leader will stretch those boundaries more than some people are comfortable with and leave things deliberately vague on purpose because it gives them more space to play whatever. But get comfortable with, with ambiguity. If you are in charge of your subordinate work group, Go ahead and make the decisions that your work group is responsible for. Not everything requires a decision from your defective leader. You already know they don't want to do it. Don't ask them to do something they don't want to do. Another great way to move a decision along is to create an artificial sense of urgency by using externally imposed deadlines. Even the most defective leader will be incredibly responsive to an external agency like a board or a council or a commission, drop something on the agenda, uh, you know, put a, we have a, an electronic filing system for our, our ordinances in my, in my community, and putting something on the agenda requires director approval. That will force me, as a defective leader, to engage with that topic and respond and decide within a certain deadline because I am now answerable to a higher authority. Uh, and, and that works with almost, almost any public agency that has an advisory board, a council, elected officials, governing body, whatever it is, an external deadline will be incredibly motivational for even the most defective leader to get a decision and get it done. And don't ask for decisions for things that should just be an FYI. Very many times we want that comfortable space to know we have our boss's approval for this thing. But you can just say, hey, here's what I'm doing, and that's it. Not even that tacit approval step of, if I don't hear from you within a certain time, uh, just turn it into an FYI. It will be remarkably more effective. Your boss will know what you're doing, and if they've got a problem with it, the time to intervene will be before the thing happens that you said will happen. Uh, you don't want ever want to catch a defective leader by surprise. Um, you don't want to catch a good leader by surprise either, but uh, particularly defective leaders are very sensitive to being blindsided. So an FYI can be far more effective than a request for a decision that they don't want to make anyway. So know your job description, know what you're authorized to do. If you have a budget and resources and a mission, go do that. You don't need any more permission. I have always described a budget as permission to spend. If something is within a budget and it's within the remit of that work group, I don't need to tell them to do that. That's their job to do that. And I actually discourage leaders from asking me for approval to do their job in my workplace because I don't like making their decisions for them. They should be doing that. So. Lastly, recognize that not everything needs to be the same. I've largely trained this out of my work group uh, in my current community, but I do recall this 15 years ago. It was a big deal that one work group picked orange safety shirts and another work group picked yellow safety shirts, each for different reasons. My only, my only joke was, was uh, make sure they sew the pockets on uh, you know, upside down so they can lean on the shovel with no hands. <laughs> But it really bothered some of the subordinate leaders that, that we didn't have the same t-shirts in two different 
work groups in the same department. And one, it, the t-shirts had already been bought, and it's safety gear, so who cares? Uh, some people think yellow is brighter, and some people think orange is easier to see. Uh, construction barrels are orange, so you don't want to confuse a person. There's a lot of reasons why colors can be a different way. If you want to start a fight, ask a firefighter which color should their fire truck be, red or yellow. That's, they will get out the knives over, over that. <laughs> But recognize that different work groups have different cultures, and that's okay. In my current work group, the solid waste team works by completely different rules, and it's even embedded in the union contract. They're different than the rest of my department, and that's fine. That's, that's how they grew up. It's been that way for decades. They don't need to be the same. We don't need to have the same color shirts on. I only insist that it have the city logo on, and we're an accredited agency, so I make them put the patch on the, on the shoulder. Uh, put the uh, embroider the the, uh, the accreditation the accredited agency logo on there. That's it. Everything else is up to them. Second bad habit is not doing what you say you will do. It, this is this is a very very bad habit. It comes from a good motivation that you want to be liked and you want to be friends with everybody. So when someone asks you something to do something, you naturally are inclined to say yes. But when you inevitably fail to deliver because that thing is difficult or complicated or more nuanced than that person's present understanding, uh, it sets you up to be a phony. And it will absolutely, absolutely tank your credibility and turn it straight upside down. Frequently found with junior and inexperienced leaders. Junior and inexperienced leaders exhibit a lot of these defective habits. By no means are they ex the exclusive owners of defective habits, but experience is what you get when you don't have any and making mistakes is a great way to acquire experience. So uh, tubing your credibility is a bad idea and that person will not forget. If they have asked you to do something and you have said yes, they will not forget that. It can be years later and when you have failed to deliver that thing to that person, anytime you offer anything else, it will always come with a caveat or an asterisk that they'll remember that time you said you would fix that thing that bothers me and you didn't do it. So some helpful tips. If you have a defective leader and you are asking them to do something, don't. They're not going to do it. If you know you are dealing with, with someone who has a propensity to overpromise and underdeliver, stop asking them. They're not going to do it. It will be a lot more psychologically satisfying for you. Yes, some things do need to be turned into questions, but not everything needs to be a question to a, to a, a leader that is engaged and experienced in this kind of defective habit. Another one is to recognize the limits of a leader's authority. And this is a little more complicated calculus in their mind. Whenever somebody wants to, you know, say, the higher up in an organization you go, the more of your brain you leave behind. That's common in any organization to think that our betters in the organization are just, they're, they've just lost their mind. And I always generously describe it as they're just responding to different incentives. I mean, our leaders are not stupid. They didn't get that job by being dumb or, or unable to articulate a coherent thought. They're just responding to different incentives. And chances are, were we in their shoes, we would make the same decision that they did because we're probably responding to the same thing. But recognize that when your leader is making a decision that's inside their wheelhouse or if it's something that requires an external authority. It's a very different calculus in my head as a department director when someone asks me to do something that I have the sum total power to grant versus if it's something that I either need city manager authority or I need to cooperate or collaborate with another department. There's a very different calculus going on in my head for that decision and my ability to say yes to something should be tempered by that because I don't want to commit to something that I do not have the authority to do. So a Decisions that rest with the leader themselves are something that is very different from something that requires someone uh, engagement with a higher authority or other partners in the agency. So if you are very specifically asking for a, a very specific thing, that is the best way to get something out of a leader that has the tendency to overpromise and underdeliver. It is also easy to help them move it along. So volunteer for things, do the prep work. There's nothing more terrifying to a writer uh, or a defective leader than a blank page. So throw the first piece of text up there, draft the email, draft the memo or the report, or whatever it is, and give it to them so that they can process it on forward. It's, it's far easier to iterate on something than it is to invent it out of whole cloth. And if you have a defective leader that will not do what they say they will do, 
help them out. Another bad habit is not doing what you should be doing, which is very different from the, the other one. There's a lot of demands on any leader in any work group in any workplace. There are always fires going on. There are always emails coming in and phone calls. If you are in the foxhole right now with an organization where everything is on fire all the time, you don't really have time for the, those higher order things. But there's always something that can grab your attention and require, require your, your management attention uh, of, of a defective leader. So things like strategic planning, performance measuring and monitoring, all of these kinds of nice to have, I'll get to them eventually sorts of things. These are all the things that are the first things to go when it hits the fan. And it's okay when you have an emergency to clear your calendar and focus on the emergency, but eventually you need to build the things that you should be doing, the things that if you go to a management course or a conference, they'll tell you these are the things you should be doing. And hopefully we're getting success stories from departments that have done these things and here to share the lessons learned for others. So helpful tip, if you are a leader that is not getting the time or the energy or the motivation to do what you should be doing, is to do those things. You have to carve out time to do the important stuff that you know you should be doing. All of these are very important and they need time on the calendar to address. I put time on my calendar to block out time to do important things like this and if I don't, they'll just get lost. And that's one of my defects is I will easily overlook these things unless I systematize a method to make sure I pay attention to them. An excellent way to make sure that you pay attention to these things is to pursue accreditation as a public works agency. Because wandering through the accreditation manual, you will find every single one of these things here represented in a chapter or a practice because the accreditation council has, in consultation with well-run public works agencies, determined you need to do these things to be considered a well-run public works agency. And so hitting these notes here helps you get to where you need to be as an effective leader. Fourth bad habit is avoiding responsibility. We have seen this everywhere. It makes for great jokes on the internet. It's the idea embedded in the, well, that's not my job. And and it, it's it's really really makes for some good really makes for some good pictures uh, when you get when you see the disconnect between different things not smiling at all and someone forgot to proofread and and uh, you know you just it, it does make you laugh when you see that that the, all the things that you know someone just wasn't paying close enough attention to that one thing and and we all get to see it but when you when you live in the real world and work with facilities and infrastructure like we do there are real impacts to to uh, to this year and I, I don't know how you're gonna navigate that um, and some well-intentioned but ultimately misguided things <laughs> that that just don't work out right. Someone has missed the boat on closing the last detail and avoided responsibility for it. Uh, and there, in the business we work in, that has that can have a real impact. Uh, hopefully, no impact here. But uh, take a take a look in the mind. We have all encountered someone in our workplaces that has defined their job down to only what they want to do. Their job description is this big, but that guy, we all know, he only does this. Uh, I encountered this early in my tenure in public works with a, 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 a supposed, uh, dr well, he was a draftsman, but he was supposed to be working in CAD. He only drew, well, he was still hand drawing blueprints uh, in the year of our Lord 2010. Um, we had, the collective we, that work group, had standardized to CAD drawings like 20 years ago, and he was still drawing because he liked it, and I think. It was probably a pacing control issue, um, but uh, he was still producing, um, you know, hand-drawn blueprints in 2010, and th there's not a good reason for it. It's much harder to share. They're much slower to draw. I think he liked it that way. Uh, but a, a, a peek inside the mind of someone that is perennially avoiding responsibility like this, defining their job down to only that which they want to do, you often find that there's a fear, a fear of failure as a motivation 
they won't want to accept the reality that times have changed, and so must they. The job description is different. They will play the victim. It's, it's everybody's fault, or everybody else is doing it too. It's not just me. Uh, you know, when things just happen by chance, you know, it happens. Um, and sometimes it hits the fan, but when it always happens to the same person by accident, it's not an accident anymore. Uh, and, and if you find someone who is perennially finger pointing to try to avoid taking responsibility, here's some helpful tips. The best and most accurate one that works for somebody that is avoiding responsibility is to know your job. Know exactly what it is that you are supposed to do so that you can get through your work day, through your work week, your work life, with satisfaction that you are doing things right. It can, uh, you know, do what you are supposed to do and chances are your boss does not even know what it is that you're supposed to do. There's 425 people in my department and I know generally what work groups are supposed to do, but uh, if I had to like interview, uh, you know, the different flavors of, of job descriptions there, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be well positioned to tell them, you need to be doing this and this and this. I rely on their supervisors and their managers for that. There are tools to systematize the acceptance of responsibility for us in the engineering profession. Once you put your seal on that document, you own that forever. It's, it is yours. You'd better make sure that it's right. Uh, and if we're not talking about sealing construction documents, a great way to, uh, to, to capture the problem of someone who is avoiding, a leader who is avoiding responsibilities by asking more questions. Just keep drilling in on the issue if they want to punt on the, without actually canceling the meeting, if they just keep being vague about it, oh, well, someone will do that. Okay, who's going to do that? And, well, it's probably someone in engineering. Okay, who, which work group should I direct my questions to? Get better about asking questions of someone that is wanting to avoid responsibility. They won't want to make a decision and won't want to pin something down because they enjoy the ambiguity because it creates, uh, it creates room for them to be wrong and it's a bad habit, but you can help your way through that situation by asking more questions until you get to a specific person, a specific contact, a specific assignment, someone will do it. And if you ever noticed how an argument about who's going to do something instantly ends when someone raises their hand and says, I will do it. Okay, moving on. Next item on the agenda is what you know will be whatever. But be careful about burnout because you can overcommit. You are in charge of your own story. When in charge, take charge. And if you are in charge of something, go forth and do it. And don't come back until you're done. It's a great way to solve the problem of people in your workplace avoiding responsibility is do your job and do it until you are until it's complete and you're satisfied with it. The fifth bad habit is passive aggressive behavior. And this is a very bad habit. It's very pernicious in the workplace because we have rules and one of those rules, generally speaking, is we need to be nice to each other. But it is very possible to be very nice and very mean at the same time. And we, the collective we, especially in the management class, have, have perfected the art of passive aggression, sometimes to our, to our detriment. So a few helpful tips to be mindful of that if you see this in yourself or your defective leader. The best way to gauge if you are wandering into passive aggression is to look for the disconnect between your response and your response. What comes out of your mouth is something like uh, this cartoon. Don't worry, it'll be fine. While inside, the visceral response is the red rage monster that is wanting to chop their head off. Uh, that's passive response inspired by an aggressive mindset. That difference there is that's going to be passive aggression. And that's something to watch out for. So how do you find it in yourself? If you see that disparity there in your own, what you say versus how you feel, I mean, you can't really gauge the thoughts of other people, but you can in yourself and you can watch for passive aggression. It is cyclical. So if you feel it, chances are the other person does too. We're just being polite. I, I live in the upper Midwest and we are unfailingly polite. So if your internal response to a situation is the red rage monster, that flash of anger, but the words that are coming out of your mouth are, don't worry, it'll be fine. You may want to take note of this. It is incredibly easy to be passive aggressive in writing, uh, especially when you are intermediated by a keyboard and a screen and the asynchronous nature of email. You can fire off that note and feel really good about it, but those words will not land with the same, the same oomph that you might if you were to deliver them in person. I have written emails and left them in my drafts folder to think about them later or, you know, just think about it for a little bit. And then later I thought, I don't need to send that email and just delete it. Or take out whole paragraphs that 
did nothing but flatter my ego by telling the other person how wrong they were. And usually I delete everything right after we'll get it taken care of. That's the, all the thing, that's all they needed to know is we'll get it taken care of. And then all the other stuff that I put in there, the inspired by the red rage monster working away on my keyboard, I just got, I just, you just have to get rid of all that. But passive aggression is usually aimed at something, a lot of conduct behind the scenes. It's the, the office gossip can be another form of passive aggression. Uh, it's going to be indirect. It's people looking for ways to hurt their target. That's the aggression results in the, in the passive conduct, but it is, it is definitely hurtful. You mean, you want to hurt the person. That's the red rage monster response. It is a cycle. As I said, passive aggressive behavior will inspire a passive aggressive response. I told you how to recognize it in yourself, that red rage monster and the, you know, if you just spew out red rage monster out your mouth, that's just straight up aggression, not passive aggression. Not recommended either in the workplace. It might feel really good in the moment, but uh, yeah, you, your, your spouse and your paycheck will regret that later. You will start a cycle that will not stop. So how do you recognize it in someone else? If your defective leader, or hopefully not yourself, badmouths direct reports or the boss when they're not around, that's passive aggression. Not giving direct feedback, bad or good. If, that's, if this is your boss, they have an obligation to evaluate your performance and tell you how you're doing. If you don't get any, that is a form of passive aggression. Someone who is critical of unimportant things is, is using that unimportant thing as a way to make themselves feel better for picking you apart and tearing you down over you know, parking spots in the, in the employee parking lot. That's not important. The hoarding of information. Information is power in the modern workplace, and a passive-aggressive leader will hoard information and be a gatekeeper because it gives them the opportunity to reward their beneficial supporters and punish the ones that they don't like. It's a, it's a very bad habit. Someone who gives vague instructions will also be reserving for themselves room to criticize the unimportant things later, or if the outcome does not make them look good, but they're responsible for you, but they gave you vague instructions, that vague instructions, those vague instructions were on purpose. And if everything works out well, then they will pat you on the back. So some helpful tips for surviving passive aggression, either in yourself or in other people's, is to stop the cycle. Don't feed the animals. Do not respond to passive aggression with more passive aggression. You also probably shouldn't respond with aggression, but uh, that's, that's, a different, that's a different thing. Uh, one of my absolute life-saving tips that has changed my life for the better is to assume positive intent. If I assume they have positive intent, it relieves me of the burden of thinking about their motivations and coming up with a suitable response. I just get to tell them, we'll take care of it, or whatever the situation-appropriate response is to the, to the business need. If you're ever caught flat-footed by someone who is very good at passive aggression in your face, uh, a very good thing to memorize and, and stick in your toolkit is the phrase, that's interesting, what makes you say that? You've made no value judgment, you haven't agreed to anything, you haven't not agreed to anything, and you've thrown the conversational football back to your passive aggressive conversation partner and giving your brain some time to catch up. So if someone has had the red rage monster response but told you something perfectly sweet and nice and you don't, aren't quite sure where to go with it, this phrase has saved my bacon time and again. And this does not get you in trouble with anybody. Interesting is not bad. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just, oh, that's interesting. What, make, what makes you say that? And it invites them to explain one layer deeper than what they've actually said. And it gives your brain time to catch up, which is very, very helpful. So when dealing with someone who is exhibiting passive aggressive tendencies, set clear expectations, limits, and deadlines, communicate them clearly. That is incredibly helpful to have it in writing with neutral business, business appropriate language and tone. Uh, communicate clear and natural consequences, even with your boss. It is fair to tell your, your leader, if you tell me to do that, this is the consequence of that. I will not do this. Is this still what you want? And oftentimes, if they're otherwise defective, 
they'll, you know, they'll you know, oftentimes backpedal. If they're actually a good leader who's just being bizarrely passive aggressive sometimes, they will understand, oh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's not, that's not going to work out because I still want that and I want this. How can we do both? Now you have a new conversation. And by communicating clear and natural consequences is a great way to break the cycle. Breaking the cycle is the very most important thing when you are engaging in passive aggressive communication with somebody. Just stop. You do not have to do passive aggressive responses to someone who is continuing to be passive aggressive. An alternative, we talked about passive aggression, outright aggression, a healthy response is assertiveness. It is okay to be assertive. You are a human, you have rights, you have obligations to your community, to your family, to your workplace. All of that works together. And you can stand up for yourself. You are your own best advocate. And assertiveness is a healthy expression that lets you work in harmony with other people, preserves your dignity and theirs. And that's important, that we keep dignity and respect on both sides of this, even if you don't want to. You want the red rage monster to punch him in the face, don't do that. And if you recognize some of yourself in these behaviors, talk to somebody about it. Figure out for yourself how to break this, that cycle, the disparity between your internal response and what comes out of your mouth. The sixth bad habit is avoiding blame. Similar to avoiding responsibility, but a little different, and I'll explain why. We've got the stereotypical, you know, buck stops here. This is the ultimate expression of willingness to accept blame People who speak in passive voice have this phrase, mistakes were made. It's so famous it has its own Wikipedia page. Mistakes were made by who? I mean, who made, that's the value of passive voice, particularly in government, in emergency crises, mistakes were made. Okay, by who and what are you going to do about it? That's, that's a follow-up question. I mean, Mark McGuire said 42 times, I'm not here to talk about the past, to avoid blame for something that he very much very much regrets, I imagine. In the workplace, the desire to avoid blame results in something that I call blame shifting, where a junior, often an experienced leader, will try to step outside of the bad thing that they don't want to be responsible for, usually an unpopular order from the boss, and they will try to point it at someone else. It's inspired by a good desire to be liked. We all want to be liked, and we've read about this, those of you that are students of history and or government and or power, whatever, we've read about this. It's in, in the, the Machiavellian document, The Prince, he says, the, the prince should, should reserve for himself the bestowing of favors on the, on the favored lieutenants, uh, and delegate to the to to the right arm, uh, right hand man, the the hard work, probably the murders and the executions or whatever, the the dirty work, so that the prince is only ever seen by the followers as you know, you know a giver of good things. But that may have worked in uh, you know medieval and Renaissance Italy for uh, you know a leader of a small city state, but it does not work in the modern workplace. The leader must be responsible for the good and the bad. And when you are told to do something that you know your work group will not like, you have to tell them. And without doing it in a way that blames either the situation or your boss. That's just how it works. When you don't do that, when the defective leader tries to sidestep and blame shift to the boss, what they're doing is taking themselves out. They have broken the chain of command. And it leaves the employees and the whole team wondering, Who's really in charge here if our own supervisor has no power to stop dumb things that we don't like from coming to, to make our job worse? Who's really in charge here? Uh, you'll see this kind of, of behavior manifest itself if you've ever heard these kind of things come out of the mouth of a leader. You won't believe what they're telling us to do now. I don't like it either, but the boss says we have to. City Hall is making us this, or the mayor wants us to that. John's instructions, the boss, are to do this. The subtext underneath all of those is, hey guys, it's not my fault, so don't blame me. Trying to step sideways, blame that guy. I watched a work group, uh, a junior leader do this, and it, that had the worst morale in the entire work group. And when I coached that junior leader to get back in the chain of command, within uh, the two years, that work group turned into the best morale in the entire work group. Nothing changed. Same leaders, same chain of command, 
same work, same orders, same stuff. The change was the leader's perspective on where he stood with relation to his team and his boss, and he put himself fully in, in between the manager and the team, and it boosted dramatically the competence of his team. So some helpful tips. Change how you say what you say if you find yourself having said any of the things there. Here's what we're going to do. The policy for XYZ is now this. Yeah, City Hall may have come up with it, but you don't have to blame City Hall for the new purchasing limits policy, whatever it is you don't like. The policy is now this. Here's how I want to tackle this next task, even if it is the most unpopular task that you've ever come across. It's your job as a defective leader to do what we are told to do. And if you have a real disagreement with your supervisor or your manager about what it is you are being asked to do, because you know it's going to be unpopular with, with the team, hash that out in private between them. You are a professional. Your manager is a professional. Yes, they may be responding to different incentives, was how I euphemistically described it earlier. Uh, they're not totally defective either. And the opportunity to sort that out and have influence on what you're going to do is behind closed doors in a one-on-one -on -one between the manager and the supervisor. And then when you come out of that room in agreement that this is what we're going to do, this is now your job, this is now your task, and you are telling the team, here's what we're going to do, here's how we're going to do it. And that's a very different reception than, I don't like it either, but I guess we ought to because... The boss said we have to. That just throws the entire work group into chaos and, and reduces all of their psychological safety. Like, oh my gosh, we can't even we can't even count on on you to defend us from these dumb ideas that you blame that guy for. Well, when they're your ideas, they don't blame the boss for it because you bring it to them if you present it in this way. Seventh bad habit is that of resume building. To a certain extent, we should all be doing some resume building. We are our own best advocates for our own careers. No one will manage your career as closely as you. Uh, but we've all seen the shameless careerists, those who uh, are always on the way to somewhere else, uh, the short-termers, that's fine. Um, but the, the flaw for the defective resume builder is that they think they're indispensable, but they are also not going to put in the time, the energy, the effort, the commitment to make your workplace as good as it could be because they're always eyeing what it is that they need, positioning themselves for what comes next. And it can lead to a lot of what I, what's referred to as empire building. You have situations and decisions that don't seem to make sense for the work group and its budgets, responsibilities, and things. It's just to make that person's resume look good and look better, and you need to pad it with some more stuff so that when they go to their next job interview at some other place, they have some shiny objects to show. And that is a very difficult situation if you work for someone like that because they're incentivized to continue doing that. And maybe they'll grace you, your workplace with their exit someday. You can probably count on it. Heaven help you if they don't. <laughs> if you've got a, a, a shameless careerist and they don't go anywhere, they're probably not very good. So some helpful tips. The most helpful tip if you find yourself working with a, a resume builder is to hold on. Your boss will get you into stuff that you really shouldn't be involved in. And that's just going to, that's, a, that's an accepted fact. They're also your boss and they get to call the shots in your workplace. So hang on. There are silver linings to that. You will get more exposure to more and more interesting things. So don't be afraid of that. Just, you know, it's just part of the territory of following the coattail. I've ridden coattails of, now he wasn't a shameless careerist, but uh, he was rapidly promoted through a, a work group, and I just followed right along behind him. And I got to do all kinds of things that a public works department should not have been involved in. And I had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> and keep your resume up to date. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, we are our own best career manager. And if you are following in the wake of, a, of someone who is rapidly moving through an organization, that can redound to your benefit through promotions in the organization. But if there is a sudden stop at the end of that cliff, you might go over it with them. And it's helpful to have a parachute. So mind your career, mind your resume, and take care of your own career future. The seven habits of highly defective leaders, uh, as I said, started out as a mean-spirited takedown. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, oh, I do some of those things too. And good leaders that I know also had some of these bad behaviors. So I, I wanted to, this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is not the only seven bad habits of highly defective leaders. So leaves room for a sequel. Thank you very much.